Hello, welcome to the Island Artist Gallery Zoom series resuming. Um, we had a, a fair number of episodes in the spring and now that we're still on COVID lockdown and people are um, stuck at home more than normal, we thought we should continue. So um, we're gonna open up this session with one on painting mushrooms since that's one of our, you know, glorious fall colors and one of the things we get to really enjoy about Sitka um, and the fall. And Kitty LeBounty has kindly agreed to join me and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the different mushrooms that we find around here. Um, Kitty is a botanist and teaches at the University of Alaska here and she has been hunting mushrooms around the Sitka area and other parts around Alaska for many years. Some of you have probably taken classes from her and if you haven't I really encourage it. It's a great experience and so Kitty is going to talk about a few of the mushrooms. I'm going to start at the really standard mushrooms and this seems to be a particularly killer year for winter chanterelles and I'm going to see if if I can maybe hold this up so they're oh yeah it's in the, it's in ball shot yeah I don't know if is there any way to zoom in a little bit on it or here I'll just hold it up to the camera so these are winter chanterelles and Kitty will talk more about them but they're a wonderful mushroom to paint because they have all of these gorgeous convoluted folds down the back and they make beautiful shadows. And I'm gonna be painting them a little brighter color than this because this is a, this is a regular golden chanterelle, um, which is one of the choicer mushrooms around. And this is like the, the Cinderella sister. Um, but often when the winter chanterelles first come out, they really have kind of a similar color um, to, the, to the golden chanterelles. And so I'm gonna paint them that way just because I like the colors. So what I'm thinking is I will, I've already started painting, but I'll, I'll talk a little more about what I, you know, kind of my process of painting something like mushrooms. And then we'll let Kitty take over and talk about the mushrooms and various aspects of it. And then we can go back and forth between screens. So you can kind of see what I'm painting and, um, if, if I put these here, Ellie, is that, that really doesn't do it as far as like a, a good shot for people to have of the mushrooms, does it? Yeah, but I think Kitty's going to pop in some. Kitty will have some photos. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be bigger. Um, and so we're asking that while Kitty's talking or I'm talking that, you know, please keep yourself muted and use the chat room for questions. And then at the end of the session, we'll have another, um, we'll have the time to open it up that anybody can talk. And please, if you're painting, um, you know, feel free. We'd love to see your paintings and maybe just, you know, do a, a little hand symbol and, and we can, we can focus on yours for a little bit. And if you have questions as we go along, um, you know, let me again put them in the chat and Ellie will will feed them to me. Ellie is saving saving my yeah saving my bacon. Um, so when I when I paint something like this, I tend to paint freehand. I you know a lot of times if I'm doing a tight building or you know something that I want it to you know really look exact, I'm going to sketch it first. But these are so fun. So what I do is just, I always work with two brushes. I have one brush that has um, just water on it. And I always work with two bowls of water of some sort. And the same thing, I use one that's dirty or painted and one that's clean. So you always have, you can always get in and work with clean water on your paper. Um, so I just take the, the whatever I'm, painting and I start following an edge of it and I'll um I'm using I'm using a Daniel Smith Aussie red gold but for this one because that just happens to be one of my favorite colors and it it's so mushroom like 
Um, but I'll dip a little bit of that on my brush and then parts of it I'll, I'll go along with just a wet brush and I will um, paint on the paper with plain water. And then I take the color and just touch it to it. And it, um, it just spreads on the paper and you get that wonderful um, loose watery effect. That, that's really why I do watercolors because I love it when it just does that on the paper. Um, so I'm gonna start following along and you know just working on my little mushroom that I started on a few minutes ago. And I'll, I think I'll, I'll probably use all three of these and just kind of work a, you know, a pattern of the three. So I get some, some stems, some beautiful folds and a little bit of the top of the mushroom. Um, and, you know, just kind of as a general design thing, odd numbers are more interesting. People like to look at odd numbers for some reason. Um, so I'm gonna put three of them in here. Um, and then why don't we maybe switch, let Kitty take over and you know tell us wonderful things about mushrooms and the rest of us can paint hopefully you're joining me in painting okay kitty you want to take it away Ah, ha, ha. There we go. Finally did things in the right order. Okay, so um, this isn't going to be a talk about edible mushrooms. I, I do those a lot. So I just want to just put that disclaimer in there right now. Um, but I wanted to um, show you a few images of some of the variety we have in terms of fungi and shapes and sizes um, and talk a little bit about what the mushrooms, what their roles are in our world. So we have a maybe a better appreciation for them. So, I mean, I can, I am not a painter. I wish I was um, because the shapes and the colors in the fungi are just incredible around here. And all of these are growing um, in Southeast and most of these are growing in Sitka, these images. So there's a huge amount of variety, shapes and sizes. But because I'm a biologist, I have to tell you a little bit about what you can't see about fungi. It's, 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 a, it's a problem. So most of fungi, what we can't see, we see these big, cool fruiting bodies, these big mushrooms, these shelves growing on wood and all that. Um, but they're made out of all these long, skinny, microscopic cells called hyphae. And why that's kind of cool is because the hyphae can, they extend into the wood and they extend into the earth and they actually make connections with trees and we'll talk about that later. So these long stringy things that are going all over the place in, in the ground in the wood and whatever are the kind of working part of the, of the fungus. And this is a, I thought a nice little image to start with. So you can sometimes see this. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever come across a tree that is broken in half or something like that out in the woods. Um, but a lot of times you see this kind of white material in between the layers of wood and all that is fungi. So this looks like this kind of cottony mess in here. That's collections of those hyphae that we looked at before that are growing more closely together and more in a mass so we can actually make them out. This isn't the fruiting bodies, which what will we mostly are wanting to paint and all that, but these are pretty cool that are out there. So that's, that's the most the body of the fungus. So my last biological slide, I swear. Um, <laughs> most of the fungi that Pat's going to be, actually I think all the fungi Pat's going to be talking about and painting are all what are called basidiomycetes. And they all shoot out spores from these little tiny gills or pore layers underneath their caps or shelves. Um, this is an example of one here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. So these are the gills on the underside of the cap. And if you had a microscope and a sharp razor blade and you cut sections through that gill, you'd see these cool images of the actual structure of the gills and these funky little bits that look like little clubs with little dots on it. Those are the spores. 
So those are hard to see um, without a microscope. Or if you cut that cap off from the stem, just neat, 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 neat right there, and put that down on a piece of paper, it'll shoot all the spores down on the paper. Um, so you can see the spores, just like you can see the mycelium, but you only really see them in mass. Um, and so these spores are all over the place and they're, they're, they, if they land in a good spot, they'll grow. Some of those good spots we like and some of those good spots for the fungi are not such good spots for us. Um, but we, 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 we get to work it out. <laughs> so I did want to show you a couple of the, the fungi first that um, Pat was, was sketching. So I'll just show a couple of these, and then I'm going to shift it back to Pat for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the golden chanterelle um, that Pat talked about. She had one in her hand there. Um, like she said, this is a, a pretty choice edible um, for us. This is one of our the ones that people gather quite a bit of around here. And we're actually pretty lucky in Alaska because golden chanterelle so far that people have found has only been found as north and west as Glacier Bay, maybe a little bit beyond Glacier Bay. Doesn't mean it's not out there, you know, in the, the land, but it does not make it into South Central. Um, does not make it up to Girdway. All the, the fungus festival people are always like, rawr, rawr, rawr. they want our golden chanterelles, but they have so many darn king leaves that they, you know, sorry, you can't have everything. <laughs> um, so this fungus is, is yeah, it's, it's choice in Southeast. There's different versions of it you know, really over most of the country where there's forested land. So these are mostly tied to trees. They're, they're mutually symbiotic with trees. And again, we'll look at some of that later. But the golden chanterelles are pretty easy to recognize by that, that wild um, kind of orangish color. There's, this one's been a little bit beat up up in here so that, you know, we're seeing a little bit into the parts that are messed up. Um, but it's kind of thick and fleshy and, and that we'll keep in mind when we compare it to the winter chanterelle that Pat's working on right now. The other thing that's kind of cool is remember those gills we looked at in the last slide that were kind of sharp edged and, you know, like if you've ever opened up a mushroom that you bought from the store and you cut off the stem and the cap was open, you could see those sharp edged gills. I guess you can mostly see that on like the portobellos that you buy, those bigger mushrooms. Usually the gills are visible on those, but they're kind of sharp edge. But if you look at these winter chanterelles, they're they're more rounded on the edges and there's a lot of interconnections in there. They actually divide quite a bit. Anastomose is the only word that ever comes into mind, but basically they branch repeatedly. Um, and so you, I hope you kind of see that in there. Um, and it's a characteristic of golden chanterelles and of a few other of these chanterelle types. It's kind of cool. So we have these kind of folds. Um, slurping I'm going to say slurping just because it's that time of night down the stem <laughs> a little bit <laughs> it's totally a scientific term so they're decurrent gills I'm trying not to get lost in terminology I'm sorry so these folds kind of go down the stem a little ways and then you start seeing the stem and it's kind of cool there's also a color change there so the stem and the cap tend to be that kind of deeper fuller orange and the the under part where those folds are is just a little bit softer looking so hopefully i think pat has something more to do with this but i'll show you the winter chanterelle okay yeah Okay, so this is a close up of one winter chanterelle. And I mean, they can they can fruit in the snow. <laughs> and this one was, this is not a setup photo. <laughs> it was like one isolated um, little winter chanterelle that was kind of hanging out for a second. Um, they look kind of similar, um, I would say to those golden chanterelles. Mm -hmm. um, but the winter chanterelles aren't, the flesh isn't as thick. And they, so they just don't tend to look as, as fleshy, I would say, or as massive maybe as the golden chanterelles. That's a little hard to get in a, in a photo, but hopefully you, you kind of have that idea. And I think when it's in your hand, it's an easy thing to see or feel the, the weight of the two of them. 
the the cap tends to be more brown i know pat mentioned a specific color she uses and she can say that again <laughs> um, but they can be kind of orangish as well so the color is a little bit variable on these guys the stems are tend to be almost flat in many cases so they can be a little round or a little flat and um, as opposed to those kind of more round stout fleshy stems in the golden chanterelle. So they're just, a, they, they overall are different. And I suspect in many ways, the winter chanterelles are more interesting to draw because they have a lot of stuff going on. Their cap shapes are really different. The stem shapes are kind of variable. There's a lot of cool color shading going on. So maybe you eat the golden chanterelle and you, you know, draw the winter chanterelle. Although a lot of people also eat winter chanterelles. They're kind of one of our more reliable things to find in the woods that you can eat that's a mushroom it's like okay they're there there there's usually what i would call troops of them and they also have these cool um, folds where the spores are born like we saw on that earlier slide that are more rounded and they have a lot of these these divisions in them there's a lot of this networking and then I had one more picture of, of these because it shows a little bit different aspect um, of the, the winter chanterelle. And that's this, the fact that it has this cool little dimple in the top in many cases. So they can be really open and flaring and kind of funnel shaped um, or not, <laughs> they can be kind of more flat. But a lot of times they do have that little dimple. This almost like it has this belly button um, inside them. And this is a nice array because these are all slightly different ages. There's the little young ones in there that are, the caps are really tight here. Let me show you, like this is a young one and this is a young one, this is a young one. And then as they get older, the cap gets bigger, it expands, and in many cases starts to kind of flare and look really irregular. Um, but yeah, there's a lot going on in that image. There's, there's quite a bit, um, I think, to draw an artist's eye. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Pat. Okay. Um, well, I've been working away on my second one of the, the winter chanterelles, and I did just want I know I'm here for the art portion of it, but I also am a, a really strong mushroom lover and spend a lot of time hunting mushrooms. And I, I just want to, I'm going to bring this over because this, I don't know, can you see, let's see if I can get this somewhere where it's, yeah, just, oh, just a sec. I just want to get a close up of this one. Yeah, there. Okay, so these were two buttons that were side by side, and I mean really close together. One of these is a golden chanterelle. It has the gills that Kitty was talking about where they come down the stem and the nice golden color and a good solid stem that if you cut it, it's going to be solid in the middle and, and, you know, kind of a golden, lighter golden, but golden color. The other one had a really similar color um, um, head black. Anyway, cap, thank you. And but it had kind of a whitish stem. And when I broke it open or cut it open, the gills were not decurrent at all. They came in clearly to the top of the mushroom. And so that's just my mushroom warning that you really want to um, be careful and you want to check every single mushroom that you're picking when you're picking to eat if you're picking for beauty you know just enjoy them but um if you're you know when you're picking your food mushrooms be really really careful that you're that you know every mushroom that you're that you're picking so then these are a couple i'll just throw in here this was my first attempt at a chanterelle um, when I realized I was doing this in a couple of weeks. And so I, I started with these. Um, I really like to um, paint from live specimens whenever possible. And especially with mushrooms, you really get more of the, the shadows and the, the shape and the form. And if you're painting from a a photo and you know we all do that tons because especially if you live in southeast Alaska you don't always get to you know be out there in nature painting or bringing things home to paint so I you know I, I wasn't 
tear, I'm gonna tighten this up a little. This is just a, a first attempt with that. And then this is another one that I thought I'd work on today if I get a little, little more time that I, I wanna pull the detail together and I haven't put any shadowing in and really the shadows are what makes these mushrooms. This one I was a little happier with. Um, you can see that one. This one, um, I just kind of let it flow and I've got the gills kind of curling down this, the stem and, um, you know, I'm going to probably darken a little shadow, a little more in here that runs through it. But, but this one I, I was happy with. And now we're going to work on winter chanterelles. And I don't know if when I'm done, you'll be able to really tell the difference between my winters and my, um, my golden chanterelles just because I, I really wanted a little more color to it than than maybe the winters have. Although I will say that I have picked winters and have them be, you know, that bright and vivid. Um, but this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm darkening it down a little as I go. I don't want to start too dark because the thing about watercolors, once you've got dark on, you've got dark. Am I? Okay, thank you. So um, you really want to think about where your lights are and you really want to keep your lights um, there out in the, you know, you want to preserve the lights. Like here on this mushroom, there isn't really any white, but I'm going to leave it there anyway because it's kind of an accent. It's where the light would be hitting the mushroom. And I, especially on some of the lines of some of the gills, I'm trying to catch that. So I'm leaving those white stripes down it. And now I'll, I'll maybe swing down here to my third mushroom. And I'm just gonna start in, and it's really scary painting without drawing first, but it's also really freeing. And so, you know, is it exactly on the paper perfectly? Eh, probably not, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. And so I'm just kind of going, going along and this is my brush that has paint in it and these brushes that I'm using they're a Princeton um, I got these at Raven's Hook it's a number 14 and that's a really nice size um, for a lot of a lot of things and they come down to a nice point they hold they're not an expensive brush um, but they hold a lot of paint and um, I've just found them to be a really good brush to use and so I have this one in my hand and then this one, and sometimes I confuse myself, but this one is just water. And so I'll, I'll start with a little edge of the, the painted one and then I'll just pull the water, I'll put plain water on and just pull it down toward the center. Um, and then I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna add a little lighter color and start in with this cause this area is a lighter. Um, region of the mushroom. It's got a little more gold to it. Um, and so I'm just kind of following those folds and then work around. And when you're painting, you're really drawing your brush toward you. Uh, you, know, you, you don't want to be jamming your, the tip of your brush down into the paper. You tend to take the brush and pull it toward you. So sometimes I stand on my head to paint a little bit. You know, that's okay too. Um, so here I'm going to go back in. I'm going to get just a little of the yellow and feed it in there. I'm kind of working my way back around to the stem. And then this is what I'm doing now is this part that's got all the folds. And I'm going to come back in and I'm going to make the, the little folds. But I'll, let's just go ahead and we'll bring this down and do just a little bit of this stock. Um, I've got the right brush with the right paint. Um, yeah, it's really, it's hard for me not to want to stop and listen to Kitty because I, you know, I feel like we always, there's just so much to know about mushrooms and we're really learning a lot right now or, well, scientists such as, you know, they are, are learning a lot and they're sharing it with us about all of the, the really wonderful interconnections. And that's been the thing I've been having a lot of fun with. Okay, now I'm going to switch and I'm going to go in with the lighter color and I'm gonna do some gills. And I just love the way they they fold. They're sinuous is the word that comes to my non-scientific mind. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of bleed some of those in and, uh, and leaving a little light. 
and that one looks too much like a triangle. Um, and so, and on the the chanterelles and the winter chanterelles, like the the golden chanterelles, the the gills actually come on down the stalk, which is really fun. You can just kind of pull them down, um, add a little light, do some that are a lighter color, because um, you get this great variation in color between the the shapes between the shapes of the folds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mushrooms are small. So you have to kind of be close. Yeah. Oh yeah. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, yeah. And I don't know if, if Kitty wants to go back and cause I'm going to be doing these little folds for a while. If Kitty wants to take over for a little bit and talk about one of the other mushrooms or. Sure. Okay. Okay. I'll do my clunky bit here. Okay. Because, yeah, I'm just going to do these in light yellow and then I'm going to come back in with a, oh, this is more of a raw sienna and I'm going to bring some raw sienna in, but I have to be a little careful that I don't do that before it starts to, I mean, before the the light yellow dries because I don't want to um, have it bleed all the way through. Okay, so maybe I'll come while Kitty talks, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna work on the, the outer portion of the mushroom. And for that one, I'm gonna do, sorry, Kitty, I told you you could talk and then I just talked right over you, but um, I'm gonna do the solid color and I'm gonna do a lot of painting the edge of it and then um, coming back in with just the plain water and, and letting the, pa the paint blend on the paper. Okay, you go. Okay. <laughs> so Thank one, of you. The, <laughs> one of the other uh, mushrooms that Pat said she was interested in painting or talking about um, was the chicken of the woods. And so that's the image that's up right now. There, there's only a vague color theme so far. It's like, oh, they're, they're, they're just orange mushrooms here, obviously. Um, this is another one of our edibles that people get pretty excited about. Um, and well, I'll come back to that in a second. But this, this particular um, mushroom is really different. And some people would call this a well, it is a type of polypore. Um, so it's a the surface, the undersurface where the pores are 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 born, or the where the spores are born. Sorry, are pores. Um, so it doesn't have gills. It doesn't have those fold things. Um, but it has like this. It looks like a very very fine sponge almost. I mean, much finer sponge than I've ever seen. <laughs> but you can imagine that, right? <laughs> That's on the underside. And on the top side, you have this, this um, more solid orange um, color with some yellows in it. They're actually really lovely. This is a very young chicken of the woods, um, which for people who want to eat them, this is kind of the ideal size. Um, once they get much bigger than this, it's like they're beautiful to admire and beautiful to paint, but they become more and more indigestible um, as time goes on. Um, Chick in the Woods is an interesting fungus, I think. Um, in other parts of the, the country where um, this sister species of our Chick in the Woods grow, people won't eat it if it's on conifers um, because they think it's a little bitter. Um, I, you know, I, I, I go back and forth on chicken in the woods. Um, some people can eat it and some people can't. Um, the way to kind of ensure that you can eat it or more likely that you're able to digest it is that if you only eat the very youngest little bits of chicken of the woods. And a lot of times I just recommend people cut out, cut off like the outer inch. So if I had a pencil, Actually, do I? Mm, I do. Wait, wait, wait. No, never mind. <laughs> oh, maybe I do. I would just cut like this. Oh, I figured it out. It's amazing. I would just eat that part. Now, that's me because I know that if I eat too much of this, uh, my body gets rid of it right away. <laughs> Um, it's not poisonous. You just can't digest it. Um, and people are different in what they can eat. Anyway, let's see if I can now erase that. 
Ooh, yeehaw. Um, okay, <laughs> so that's Chicken of the Woods, and I have a couple other images of it, but um, this, we had an incredible fruiting of this fungus this year. There was a lot of them, um, probably starting even in late July, but August they were really thick. And now, you know, we're kind of just seeing the remains of these chicken of the woods. And I saw, oh, you're having chanterelles for dinner? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Um, <laughs> anyway. So it's probably past time that you would have had chicken in the woods, but this one, I know um, when I was teaching my class earlier this month, people were freezing it. Um, did you have a question, Lynn? Someone has their hand raised, but I will just go on. Yeah, it's Lynn, but. So are, can I talk for just a sec? I'll show. I'm viewing Kitty's screen, but I'll just bring my chicken of the woods out here for a second. Oh yeah, I love that. Oh yeah, it was so beautiful this year. So I'll just real quick bring my chicken of the woods in because I spent a lot of time painting chicken of the woods. Um, and they're, I don't know, now I probably have to go out a little bit. Um, sorry, we're gonna make Ellie work tonight. Ugh. Always do. Yes, you do. There we go. Okay. So I really had trouble painting chicken of the woods. I thought they were they're they're such an incredibly beautiful mushroom, and yet they were really hard to paint. Um, so this was my first attempt. And then I got bigger and bolder. Um, and I still didn't like it. Um, and then this one I'm thinking might be okay. I don't know. Like it. Yeah, I don't know if it really shows, but I was trying to get the, the contrast between the chicken of the woods and the, the dark wood um, behind it. And then there were some little dried leaves and I, I can't stop thinking about the mycorrhizal stuff. And I don't know if chicken of the woods is a mycorrhizal mushroom or not, but um, I, I was trying to put in little, like little veins coming down from the mushroom. I, I just couldn't help myself. And then after I did those two, I tried one more time or those three. And this is my abstract chicken of the woods. And I'm, I'm probably not quite done with it yet, but that's, I, I'm gonna add a little more color in, but I was really having fun playing with just the shapes of chicken of the woods. So. That's my, that's my painting portion. Back to you, Kitty. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself till I stopped giggling. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is a, another one of the images of Chicken of the Woods. And I'm sorry, the, the one on the left is kind of an old image. You can see it was a rainy day and there's a little bit of the rain bit there, but I still really like that that image because it, it shows, you know, the Chicken of the Woods coming out of the tree. So I hate to disappoint you about Chicken of the Woods bat, but Chicken of the um, Woods is not mycorrhizal. <laughs> uh, okay, it, well. It, it, is, it is a pathogen. So all fungi, like animals, like all animals need to get their nutrients, their carbohydrates from something, right? We can't make our own carbohydrates from, from the air and neither can fungi. So they need to get those things from someone else. And those someone else's are usually plants. I mean, they, they actually, there's a, more of a story there, but we'll just start with the simple version of the story. And so when those spores get blown around in, in this particular case of the chicken woods, we have another, we've probably heard of the artist conchs and bear breads. They're kind of the same sort of um, type of fungus in many ways, in that they're these shelves that, that um, grow out of the wood and they're all parasites of the wood. Um, so there, there, it's a slow, it's a slow pathogenic death. It's not a, it's not a quick one. So they land, there must be some sort of wound in the tree so they can get established. And then they start growing through the tree. And by the time they actually fruit, um, that tree is pretty much is fully infected. 
or you know it's the the mycelium is is taken up quite a bit of the energy it needs in order to produce these big fruiting bodies so one thing you might have noticed if you're familiar with chicken in the woods is that it's ephemeral so it will come out in you know july august maybe rarely as late as september do you get new ones but sometimes you do um, and then it will fade it'll drop its spores and it will slowly turn white and kind of fall apart and that's really different probably from maybe the one of the more or two of the more familiar types of um, polypores that are out there. Like I said, the artist conch, I suspect you're familiar with that. It's the one that it's white on the bottom. And if you scratch the bottom, um, it'll turn brown. And people do beautiful drawings on those artist conchs. They can be just gorgeous. Um, there's another one that's even more common, and that's people here in Sitka call it bear bread. Um, it's, it's, it's a name, it's a very local name. You, you hear it a little bit on the edges of Southeast, but nobody else in Alaska or in the lower 48 will generally know what you mean if you say bear bread. The, they'll, they'll concoct some wonderful story about, you know, I don't know, hamburger buns or something. <laughs> um, but it's definitely not, not these guys. Um, anyway, those are perennial. So those will just keep getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, I think they're another, you know, maybe they're a simple subject um, for artists, but they're kind of cool because they, they grow in these annual rings and they just keep kind of getting bigger um, and they can become quite large. So take a look for those sometimes. So I did want to show you a little bit about what these guys do. You already saw a little bit of it. I showed you that mycelium. So this isn't necessarily chicken of the woods mycelium, but and you may think, oh, it's a pathogen. This must be bad, right? Pathogens are bad. They, they make things sick. They kill trees, all this sort of stuff. We ourselves do not like pathogens that affect us. That's for darn sure. Um, but in terms of the whole forest ecosystem, this role of fungi as pathogens is actually pretty important um, in balance, of course, with all things. But what... Um, the most important thing that these fungi do in our very long lived temperate rainforest is that they actually weaken these trees and it allows the wind to more easily break them. And that allows gaps in the canopy and that allows light to come down. And so understory plants can do better. Um, so they're actually pretty important in the structure of our forests. Um, we don't have fire that, you know, wipes things out. So we have these little patchy um, gaps that form in the forest that are incredibly important. So that's, these are little close-ups of my sim. I went up Indian River several years ago after a storm and there were the most amazing snap trees. And yes, I had to take pictures of all the mycelium in the snap trees because it was pretty cool. And here's just backing up a little bit. So um, I think the tree on the left, you can see here's this mycelium in here um, that's weakened this tree. It's broken off in the wind. And here's one that the rot has even gotten further. And you just end up with this kind of, oh, it's called cuboidal rot. So right, it kind of has that sort of angular sort of look to it. And in many cases, you may have noticed if you've looked at rotten wood that's being decayed, that color of orange brown is about the same color as our soils, you know, the upper part of our soils. That's because most of our upper part of our soils is of these, these trees, this half decayed um, material. It's mostly lignin that's left over from trees and the fungus decomposition. And this is one I had to show. I don't know if Pat ever saw this because this is actually from the trail <laughs> right near the neighbor's house on the way to my house. And this was a tree um, that at some point in its life got completely infected by a fungus. And on a perfectly calm, non-windy day, this tree fell over. And it fell over because there was no real structure left to it at all. And there was no real structure left to that standing tree because of the action of these um, parasitic fungi. Fortunately, um, I had walked past, I'd walked past it, the tree was up, and then I walked back and I was like, whoa. <laughs> I 
was very happy that I wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> um, but that axe is actually what I was able, that's a pretty wimpy axe, if you can see that axe. That axe, I just whacked at that tree for a while and broke off enough of it in a pretty short order that I could, that when my garden friends came by, we could actually move it. But that's how weak that wood was. Believe me, if you've ever tried to like start smacking a big tree with an ax, it's gonna take you a lot longer if that tree, if that wood is intact. Um, but in this case, it had really done some serious damage. I promise I will talk about mycorrhizae. Um, but I'm gonna show a quick one, I think, oops, there's more rot. Sorry, I'm really into rotten wood for some reason. Um, <laughs> the, another fungus that Pat asked me to talk about just a little bit because she liked to paint it is uh, Ammonitis. And I hope you brought those paintings because <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of different um, images of Ammonitis. We have a few different species. And this is a point where I want to remind people that just because a mushroom is poisonous, it doesn't mean you can't touch it. You can touch mushrooms that you're not going to eat. It's not a problem. Um, it's really only a problem if you take that poisonous mushroom or several of them and put them in your mouth, chew them and swallow them. Um, up to that point, it's, it's okay. So don't ever feel nervous about actually picking these mushrooms um, to draw or to look at. It's, it's perfectly fine. I mean, you could be the very rare, extremely rare exception that it causes a problem, but um, I have not heard of that, that case. Um, so this is our common ammonite, and I realized I just had, except for the opening picture, I just had pictures of our yellow version. Um, this is an ammonite muscaria, or the fly agaric. And super easy to recognize because it's it's kind of a stout and very showy mushroom. Um, they can be bright yellow or bright red, and they have those cool little lumps and bumps on them. Um, do you want me to show a couple more of these before you go on to the, that picture, or how do you want to no, do no, this? Go ahead. No, okay, go ahead. so that's a group. Just, just showing the red. And then this one, so when they start out, the, the caps are really tight and closed in, and then they expand. Um, here's another one just showing different, this is actually a different species. This might be the one, Pat might have also done this, um, Augusta it's called. But they all, many of them that, there's a number of species that kind of have this look to them. They have this cool ring around the stem. Um, they have this kind of broad and base that I have a, a image I can show you. And then they have what we call, end up calling them warts um, on the top. They're obviously not warts. It's actually a membrane um, that covers the entire mushroom when it's a very small button. And as that membrane breaks, it leaves pieces on the cap and usually at the base. The ring is actually formed by a membrane that forms between the cap and the stem. So it's that little, that ring, it's also called an annulus, um, are protecting the gills and the spores as they're growing. Um, and that overall membrane, it's called the universal veil, is um, protecting the whole mushroom as it develops. And here you can get a little bit more of a sense of what they look like. So here's a really young one here. Um, and here's this cool base of it. I have a close-up of that um, and the warts on the top. So I, can, should I tell them a funny story? Sure. <laughs> and then I'll switch it back to the pack. Um, I'll show you one more picture while I'm doing that. Okay, so just quick look at that. We'll go back. Um, so this mushroom has a, a pretty interesting ethno-mycological um, history. Um, it has a lot of ritual uses, particularly in Siberia, traditional uses. Um, so there's a whole lot of literature associated with its uses um, for having visions. Um, it's, so it is does have some, some hallucinogenic properties. Um, it can also actually make a person quite ill. Um, but someone somewhere along the way decided to, to test it. There was data, there was some evidence out there that it was edible if it was treated the right way. Um, in fact, it's not just edible, but really good, very tasty. And so there's, a, there's this whole 
um, saying about you, you boil, you put, they're pretty meaty mushrooms. So you can actually boil them in water, throw the water out, boil the water again, throw them out. You know, you do that a few times and then you cook it again. And if you've been successful, <laughs> um, they, they taste really good and you don't see things. <laughs> um, if you're not quite successful at that, you, you could make yourself a little ill and no doubt will be seeing things for quite some time. Um, but there's, if you're interested in edi edibility of Ammonita muscaria, there's some interesting articles out there. But I did just want to quick show you this before I switch back to Pat. Um, and this is what the close up of the base of those stems look like. They're just beautiful. Even, yeah. even this non artist here can appreciate that. So I'm going to flip back to you there. Yeah, they're, they're gorgeous. They're, they're not the mushrooms that I'm going to try eating, although I have heard people say that they're good. And I've read the whole procedure of how, you know, you want to proceed with it, but I've never done it. Um, so this is that warty looking. I, I, they are a membrane. And I was actually trying on this one to get some of the, I don't know if you can see in here, maybe I get a little closer. I was trying to get the look of just that membrane along. These are the warts. And it was interesting because the warts, when you really look at them close, they look like barnacles. They look like little tiny barnacles, which for those of us who live around here and are in a marine climate, that's a you know, you see barnacles all the time. Well, that's, they, they have little, they, they're, they come up, you know, they have little lines up the sides that are kind of a triangular shape, roughly. Um, and then they have that beautiful, and I really didn't do it justice here, but I was trying to get that base where it's just, you know, covered in those, you know, those little tiny perfect ridges. They're, they're just the most spectacular mushrooms. Um, makes it really fun to wander around the island. This one, I realized that as I was focused so hard on the mushroom, and normally when I paint, I try to do the background in with the subject. And because I was working on mushrooms and getting them to look hopefully like mushrooms, I didn't do the backgrounds as much along with the, the mushroom. And I ended up, I've got this mushroom like dead center in my my painting so but I like this mushroom so I think what I'm going to do with this is work on over I'm going to add something over in here that draws your eye that direction and so I'll I'll change the focus of it a little bit if that doesn't work I'll take another piece of paper I mean I'll 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 cut it off and so I'll frame it so that the mushroom is off to the side. Let me see if I can get another piece of paper. I have a really bad habit of drawing on the backs of things. Anyway, so so the mushroom will end up being off to the side, and you know maybe there'll just be a little gentle um, color that that goes over to the other area. But anyway, that's the. I I'm not done working with the rest of the painting and I may try and go back and make those a little more regular down around the base, but most of it's done. Yeah, it does. Petty pants. Yeah. When I was young, we used to have petty pants. I could tell a funny story about those two, but I'm not sure that I want to share that. Um, um, anyway, so this is an Amanita mascara. This is like the the mushroom that is on the cover of books and you know the the really traditional hallucinogenic mushroom although um never tried it i have i have no idea um anyway i was really happy with this one one of the things with this because it's such a vivid red mushroom with a little bit of oranges and stuff in the top of it but it's really important to get a little bit of that color in the rest of your painting, because if you just have this blood red, beautiful orange, blood red mushroom or a blood orange one, I, you know, any of those things, it just looks artificial if everything else in the painting is a different color. So, you know, just to tie your painting together, you know, you really want your colors to run through everything. So like I've used the blues in here and I've got a little blues in the mushroom, a little blue in the shadow of the mushroom, the same thing, you know, a little bit of the reds, a little bit of the oranges. And it just, it just makes 
your mind kind of relaxed a little and say, oh yeah, it's it's real, whether it is or not. Um, and one of the other things that with especially these kind of paintings where they're it's really detailed in that you know and pretty tight in that area it's nice to have some place in your painting and i haven't achieved it here um that that's kind of calm so so as your your brain works around the painting you want to leave some things for your brain to fill in i you know you want something that's left for um that makes it not a photograph something that is just kind of suggested and then your brain magically kind of fills the rest of that in anyway so those are my amanitas um i grew up thinking they were amanitas but um i'm i'm slowly learning okay so back to the winter chanterelles i kind of i've got my three chanterelles i i kind of cross the stems over here so that they're you know they're more of a shape rather than you know individual pieces and then i'm going to go in and and like i said i usually like to do the background as kind of as i'm going along with the painting but i'm going to go in and i'm just pure water on my brush and or well it's actually it's not quite pure water because it was um in the dirty water bowl instead of the plain one and i'm going to go around and i'm going to outline a little bit just with the water and work down from there and so what I'm doing is putting my shadows in and these, you know, it may not be a complete painting, but we're, when I look at the mushrooms here on the, the table, there's just a little shadowing in here and I'm gonna make that more intense. I'm gonna make it, that's, it's gonna be more of a focus. So anyway, 10 minutes, how can the time have gone that fast? Um, okay. so. I'll do it quickly because um, I want you to get to see my favorite part of painting is when you've got this, you've wet the paper and you have, um, you know, just those areas. And then I'm going to take my other brush and I'm going to go in with a blue because I've used a tiny bit of blue in the mushroom and I'm going to put it in and I'm just going to let it do its thing. And so I'm going to go along here and if it fades into the mushroom a little bit, I'm not very concerned about that, but I just want it to emphasize the, the light colors of the mushrooms. And I'm not gonna go all the way around any of the mushrooms with the bright colors with, with any, I mean, I might go in with another color, but um, when you do this, you, you don't wanna outline the mushroom. You just wanna, um, give it emphasis you want to give it some extra life and a probably i'm thinking this is too blue so i'm going to go back in and i'm going to grab a little bit, a bit of cascade green which is a a wonderful alaskan and uh, rainforesty color it's it's a blue green and and it sort of separates out as you use it um so you get kind of the the two separate colors and the other thing i've done is gone in and i just have a little bit of dark under the mushrooms because where they um are in the ground and i've picked some of it off but there you know there's earth there that's in my let's see anyway there so you can see and i'm just trying to um to show that and so then i'm going to take my brush that has just pure water after I put this intense blue and um, maybe too intense. You get to see me make mistakes too, that's part of the game. Um, anyway, so as I take that and I just add water, it, um, it pales it out a little. And then the upper portion, I'm gonna put a, I'll maybe pull a little blue out of the bright area and I'm gonna put a little blue there but then I'm gonna wash my brush fairly well. And then I'm gonna come back in with some of the maroon and I'm gonna just hit it with maroon in here to add so that it's not such an intense blue because I felt like that it detracted from the mushroom. Um, so that's gonna, when you do that, see how it pops the mushroom out? It just makes it so fun. A little there. And maybe just a little here to kind of pull these two together. 
And then maybe I'll add a little up here and use my, um, my plain water brush and, you know, move the paint around. Okay, so that's really, that's kind of how I put the background in if I didn't do it beforehand. And if I do it beforehand, I kind of do the same thing, but I work around where the, the center of interest is going to be and um, add the, you know, add that, work it in later. So, um, oh, I guess we have to ask for questions. We didn't even get to all of the mushrooms. Questions, anybody? Comments? You can unmute. Here, Pat, I could show them the mycorrhizal uh, thing, why they think of. Um, okay, good. Because that's the coolest thing of all. <laughs> Oops, going backwards. Okay, so Pat was talking a little bit, and, and I know I'll stop as soon as there's some questions to be answered, but okay. Pat was talking about the interconnection between fungi and plants. And I talked about one of those, the pathogens, but another one is that symbiotic, um, mutualistic symbiotic connection. A pathogen is also a symbiotic relationship, just not maybe how we think about it. Um, but all of our trees are interconnected with a lot of the common fungi that we see um, growing on the ground. So those golden chanterelles, the winter chanterelles, the ammonitas are all connected um, with these trees. And I think there is a question. Oh, she's just said she's got to go. Okay. So, okay, um, goodbye. So that was one. And then I did want to say it's not just the trees. Come on, baby. There we go. It's most of the plants around here are actually connected with mycorrhizal fungi. So trees, ferns, orchids, the shrubs, all sorts of good stuff. What? And some plants are so connected that they don't photosynthesize at all. They're parasites on this mycorrhizal system. And that's our little coral root orchids and some of our pine saps here. Um, so maybe I should stop there. But I wanted to, I wanted to talk about that connection that was important to, to, to me, to Pat, to lots of people. And actually, not we aren't the important part. It's really important to the ecology of pretty much the planet. And can I just add on to what Kitty was saying? Um, we didn't get to the coral mushrooms, which I just have been fascinated with lately. And I'm going to bring these in. I, I just did these really delicate little, because coral mushrooms are these really delicate little, I'll pull, I'll pull a mushroom up. There's mushroom. That's a, a group of corals. And I was so fascinated because I just have been kind of learning some of this about the mycorrhizal portion, but these mushrooms were growing right down along the path of a root of the tree. It went, I don't know, 15, 20 feet, I'm at least 15 feet with these clumps, individual little clumps of the coral mushrooms. And I just thought they were gorgeous and so fun to paint. And I just... I took a picture of the the winter chanterelles and then with what I did as far as the the actual painting such as it is and then I was thinking I'll do the same thing with the coral so if anybody wants to continue on with this after their own on their own after we're finished um uh, they can here's another coral coral one that yeah there a little delayed there so anyway same thing that it's the clubs they just follow along in a little line they were it was really fun and these i wasn't finished with i was going to make the lines darker and in the and bring out the individual lines in the coral because they're so cool um but this is one that i that i did the background first i you know just kind of put some delicate you know color in there so that you're not working on white paper and yeah, so I will take a picture of this. And if anybody wants it to do their own um, paintings, they're welcome. And thank you all. Um, and don't go away. I have, I have one quick thing to say first, um, but I don't know if anybody has anything for Kitty other than thank you so much. Really appreciate um, 
all you had to say. And I was really having trouble concentrating on painting, painting my mushrooms because I wanted to pay attention to your slides and you know to your talk. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, and I didn't get into, was to talk about a nature journal. And it doesn't need to be a nature journal, but what I realized, startled and horrified myself with, is that I started to recently, whenever I have a minute to spare, I pick up my phone and I start looking at my phone, or maybe I take pictures with my phone, but it's all on my phone. And I just want to put a plug in to everybody here to one of those times when you're reaching for your phone, reach for your pen and paper or pencil and paper, paints, anything really it, you you really learn about things in a whole different way when it's hands on and when you're you know you're actually really looking at those mushrooms instead of just taking a picture and going on about your way and so the island artist gallery the next one of these um is going to be lisa tees talking about her work with pen and ink and it's celebrating inktober inktober um, which is a month of doing ink drawings. And we're going to put out a prompt every day on the Island Artist social media, Island Artist Gallery social media. Um, and if people can take, a, you know, take that prompt and do something in pen and ink about it and then post it and tag us, then um, what plants... Um, anyway, let me just finish that thought because it just went away, um, that we'll put it on the website and then we'll talk about it and Lisa will give us a, a really great presentation about her work. So someone just asked what pla what plant was that? And I'm yeah, so, so basically most of the chanterelles um, interact with a lot of the conifers, but they also will interact with some of the other shrubs. Um, some work that I did with students looking at tree roots and fungi that were in them using genetic methods, there was <laughs> a whole mixture of different mycorrhizal fungi in any given plant. It was actually pretty interesting. So it's not just one kind with one. Um, it, it is pretty interesting. And they, yeah, anyway. So there's not a there's not a one. Some are more um, closely related. Some of the birch bolites they're basically associated with birch. Um, so we don't see those here. But um, a lot of them are more. Um, they're they're not so fussy who their partner is. How about cedars? Is there anything okay, that you know I, that I was? Go ahead. Hi. I was the person that asked the question what uh, plants chanterelles are associated with. Um, it seems like sword ferns are a plant that deters mushrooms. Like, I don't think I've ever found a mushroom under a sword fern. Have you had that experience that certain plants um, fend off against mushrooms? Well, one of the thing is, um, I. I... I don't live with sword fern, so I'm not, you know, as, as up on their associates, but a lot of the, the cedars, the ferns are associated with a different type of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and they're fungi that don't produce these mushroom fruiting bodies. They produce, they have these underground spore carps. Um, so that could be one of the reasons, mm. but people do find in the, in the sword fern, in, you know, sword ferns are part of the, the older Dugford forest. You do find, you know, chanterelles and things like that in there. So I don't know if they, they actually inhibit them or if they're just associated with different fungi. So they're not really fostering them. Um, but now I'm going to have to look and see if there's any research on that. Good question. Thanks. I think that's it. Thank you all so much. And um, join us again next month. Um, I don't have the date at the top of my um, it's the second Wednesday, the 13th. So, yeah. And thank you, Kitty. That was fascinating. I really appreciate it. And I like if watching I ever paint. do a painting you want, it's yours. <laughs> oh, okay. Huh. Serious. <laughs> Be careful what you say. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. <laughs> Just.
<laughs> okay, thank you all. Thanks, um, so really fun, nice everyone. to see everybody. Nice to see old friends, new friends, um, guests.